Good morning um, and welcome to the latest Bytes webinar. Today's focus uh, is on realising your cloud investments uh, through the use of Snow Commander. Um, in terms of an agenda, um, I'll shortly be handing over to Ali um, from Snow um, to go through cloud management and how you can gain visibility and, and reduce costs. Um, I'll follow on um, by then um, letting Colin deliver a demonstration, a brief demonstration um, of Snow Commander. Um, Ali will summarise for us and then we'll, we'll kind of go through the Q&A. Um, just before I hand over to Ali, just probably wanted to touch on um, our partnership with Snow. Um, and I know that some of the uh, attendees on the call today or on the webinar today are actually indeed Snow customers. But the Bytes and Snow relationship has been going on for around about 13 years now. Um, and during which time sort of our customer success has resulted us um, sort of being, becoming a top three worldwide partner um, of Snow. Um, Snow's technology actually underpins um, a large majority of our SAM managed services. Um, and our customers rely on that technology heavily um, to capture the data that we need to deliver outputs, um, optimization, and general licensing advice and guidance. Um, it's probably safe to say that, that our partnership over the years has been hugely successful in delivering a huge amount of benefit uh, and value to our customer base, and, it, and it's one that we're immensely proud over. Um, and on that note, um, I'm going to hand over to Ali um, to um, go through the first agenda point. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me just get this up. Okay, so uh, very excited to be here. Um, glad to get the chance to talk to you all about cloud cost optimization. Um, there's lots of things that uh, people ask us about when it comes to cloud management. Cost optimization is certainly top of mind right now. Um, I will touch on a couple other smaller things, but we have a lot to cover. Um, wanted to jump straight in and show you e exactly where I think some big uh, areas of savings are in the cloud. And not all of these are specific to our product um, or, or Bytes of Service offering. These are just the tips, the tricks um, that we're seeing that you can take advantage of. So first, of course, we all know that the cloud um, is exploding in growth. Um, the migrations, um, e even in during the kind of the times that we're in right now, are accelerating. So even these forecast projections might not be accurate. Um, we might be seeing a faster adoption. I know that Microsoft um, in their latest uh, earnings report said that they've seen two years of digital transformation in two months. So uh, the adoption of SaaS, the adoption of uh, cloud infrastructure, it's all certainly accelerating. And from the IT management teams, IT executives that we talk to, there's certainly a concern over costs, over governance, what are people doing um, in the cloud and are we keeping the company secure? Um, so all of these kind of questions are just kind of looming over a lot of IT departments. And that's why we want to start with a cost optimization webinar, but this is the first um, of a couple webinars in this series uh, where we hope to talk about all things cloud management. So here are the nine topics I want to cover uh, when it comes to cloud cost optimization. So um, we'll start with a few of the contracts, so the enterprise agreement, hybrid benefit, uh, things like that. Then we'll go into management tips and tricks, so right-sizing, decommissioning, downsizing um, your instances in the cloud. Um, and before I get too in-depth, um, none of this is, uh, when, when we start talking about optimization, efficiency, et cetera, that includes your on-premise environments. Certainly enterprise agreements, hybrid benefit, things like that are cloud specific, uh, but you can also take all of those best practices into your data center, into your private cloud, um, or you can carry them over into the public cloud, which we're more focusing on in this webinar. So when we talk about uh, production environments, we typically try to focus on contracts. Um, most of the organizations that we talk to, um, your production environment is not something you're going to be tinkering with too much. You don't want to be spinning things up, down, changing sizes. It could break things in the production environment. So that's where we typically see people focus on your enterprise agreement. So how do you get that 20% um, savings across the board on your cloud? Uh, reserved instances, how do I commit <clears throat> for certain applications or certain resources? 
Uh, if I do a one, two, three year commitment, um, I could save some big money there just on those instances. Um, Azure hybrid benefit is certainly something um, that's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, and especially for people on the call today, when you have um, the software license management tool set uh, from Bytes and you have complete visibility of your licenses on premise, you know the Windows server and the SQL server licenses um, that are unused that could be ported over to the cloud and that could save you big on those resources in the cloud. The last one, and this is a smaller one, is regional variants, where if we were to deploy to a specific uh, cloud region, we could save some more money. And that one becomes a little bit harder in production, uh, but it's worth mentioning. So I'll, I'll dig into these a little bit. So when it comes to enterprise agreement, um, you know, I've been doing this for a while. Uh, Colin has been doing this for 14 years. And we have not seen a lot of consistency in enterprise agreements or enterprise discounts when it comes to cloud. Um, everyone kind of has their own rules. So when it comes to Microsoft, um, you have to have a minimum annual spend of a million dollars. We've heard from AWS that sometimes it's as high as they expect you to spend five million dollars a year. Um, the commitment lengths vary um, and the discounts on particular services vary. So what the, the best advice we can give from that we're hearing from other people is when you negotiate your enterprise agreement, it's really good to understand what you're using your cloud for and what you expect to be using it for for the next two years. So if you think you are going to go database heavy, you wanna negotiate deeper discounts um, on database resources because it's too easy to agree to a 10% you know, savings across the board um, on each individual service. But if you're primarily 50% of your cloud spend is in databases, that's not gonna maximize your benefit there. So being careful about how you negotiate which discount, um, particularly with Microsoft, is important. Uh, when it comes to AWS, we've heard mixed reviews on enterprise agreements. Um, I've seen very large billion dollar uh, corporations that have had discounts as low as 5% um, in Amazon with their enterprise agreement. So it's gonna vary for everybody. It's gonna depend on your cloud spend um, and it's gonna depend on the types of services uh, that you're using. So understanding all of that before you go into the negotiation, I think is quite important. The next one is around reserved instances and I'm not going to go um, into all the different regions and the variances and prices here. Um, this is North America, so I did a really, really deep dive um, on North American regions to see what the price differences were, what the discounts were across the board. And the takeaway that I want you to have from this slide is that regions vary. Um, it matters which resource you're using. So a Windows uh, resource in Azure is cheaper in these regions here. Um, but when we go over to Linux, we see that only one region carries over those maximum benefits. And then we go back to SQL database and we see even a little bit different variance there um, in the regions and the prices. So all I would say is that if you're up for it, um, you could do a little bit of investigation. And then at the time of deploying applications, identify which region is the most cost effective for you, but also understanding if that region is going to serve your end customers or your internal users the best. Uh, of course, we want the region that has the lowest latency, the most features, um, and the best performance for the application and the purpose that it's gonna serve. Um, but if two regions tick that box, why not go the extra mile and save 10, 20, 30% um, by switching region? So when it comes to Azure Hybrid Benefit, um, Microsoft is doing some really interesting things here. Um, and, and I was having a conversation with um, ITAM Review about this uh, just a couple weeks ago. And there's almost um, a little bit of a monopoly around Microsoft licenses that's happening. And when we think about it at the end of 2019, they mandated that no new licenses purchased on premise could be ported to any cloud going forward. Now, of course, there's still a hybrid benefit and a savings opportunity for you for the decades of Microsoft licenses that you've accumulated. Um, I know that we talk to uh, customers all the time that still have 
uh, fairly sizable deployments of Windows Server 2000. Um, so 20 years later, we still have legacy technology sitting in data centers and, and all over the place. And that's perfectly fine. I mean, that's, uh, if, it, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Um, but what I would say is that Microsoft is taking aggressive moves to prevent the use of carryover licenses into AWS. Um, so you're gonna wanna be careful of violations of employees carrying over new licenses into AWS. But kind of more importantly, you wanna take advantage of this hybrid benefit if Azure is your primary cloud. So first understanding the license makeup of what you have on premise, and then seeing what you can carry over to the cloud um, and getting the report and the analysis um, of the savings that you could achieve. Um, and that's something that the, the platform does well. I, I had mentioned regional placement. So in my analysis, um, it was very easy um, to get a 12% savings um, on a workload deployment just based on the region I would deploy in. And that wasn't um, just like East Coast of United States versus West Coast. It wasn't that it was uh, regions that were in the middle of nowhere. Um, but a lot of people don't, are too busy. You don't have enough time to keep up with where are all of the new regions spinning up. Um, and when we think about um, multiple regions being clustered together, if, for example, if UK West uh, became an overloaded region, Azure could spin up a UK East region overnight. Um, and if they do that, they're gonna have incentives uh, to pull people into that region. So a new region can spin up and you can get some big savings in that just because the other uh, cloud location is getting pretty overcrowded. So I would say it's worth paying attention to and it's worth um, when you're doing your major deployments, deciding which region is gonna be the most cost effective, but still meet all of your needs, of course. So that was um, a focus mostly around production environments and what I kind of consider to be contracts and agreements. So you're locking yourself in for a couple of years to get a decent amount of savings. Um, and when it comes to regional placement, you know, you're doing a lot of analysis uh, to pick a location that works for you. So I would say those are heavy on the effort, but you can get some really big savings there. Um, some big ways to save in the cloud are all around your non-production environment. So the development, the test environments, um, the internal um, experimentation environments. And here are some five, uh, five large ways uh, to really, really save in these environments. So the first one, of course, is decommissioning and right-sizing. So just getting rid of the waste. And people can underestimate um, how much waste they have. We, we put 10% there as a conservative amount. Um, we've been in environments where, um, you know, it, it's a 10 year old environment and people were kind of doing uh, whatever they needed to do to support the business for the last 10 years. IT is doing its best uh, to respond and spin up resources as fast as possible for those users. But of course users, um, they don't ask for an appropriately sized instance. They don't tell you when things need to expire. Um, so life cycles aren't set on resources. And then we just have this uh, challenge over time of this uh, constantly accumulating waste. So decommissioning and right-sizing is a great place to start. Uh, power schedules are huge uh, for development environments. Um, so just putting machines to sleep in the cloud means 100% savings while they're turned off. Um, then we move on to an Azure specific savings, which is um, the dev test environment. So if we know that it, an environment is dedicated to developers, we can just take advantage of Azure's pay-as-you-go or their enterprise dev test environments. That can save a lot. Um, this, these last ones are kind of interesting. So um, if I have release environments where I, this kind of sitting in between my um, development environment and my production environment. So as I'm coding and shipping product, it's going to live in a staging environment or a pre-production environment temporarily. Um, why would I leave that running all the time? Why wouldn't I just spin it up for the week of testing that it needs to, uh, that needs to occur and then turn it down for the rest of the, the quarter that no one's using it? So that's a, a good opportunity to save there. And then lastly, another Azure specific uh, benefit. You can kind of see that Azure has uh, the most programs. Microsoft, um, in all its wisdom, always seems to have multiple different angles uh, and programs that you can save. Uh, there are these developer credits. 
And of course, um, we all know that Microsoft tends to give away the development uh, toolkit for free and then charge a pretty penny on the production environment. So if you're already focused on Microsoft, um, why not take advantage of the savings? Um, if you're not already focused on Microsoft, it might not make sense to use uh, Microsoft purely for uh, the Azure dev test environment or the developer credits, but of course that's an internal conversation. So before I jump into optimization, um, because this is really our sweet spot and, and we've seen a lot of success here and you know, it's, it's easy to talk percentage savings and things like that, uh, but I'd rather just share a couple stories um, of some customers that have had um, a lot of success. So, you know, one of our customers, a Fortune uh, 500 global retailer, um, after they implemented the system, within eight weeks, they were eliminate, able to eliminate 1,500 um, instances in uh, waste. So these, this is, you know, a symptom of that problem I was talking about earlier, where the environment's been alive forever. We've been doing lots of work. Um, and we've just been responding to user requests, but no one's gone back and audited or cleaned up or set expiries or life cycles on resources. So being able to eliminate 1,500 workloads within um, eight weeks saved them almost $4 million um, off their cloud bill. So I think that's a huge uh, opportunity that a lot of people can take advantage of. And one of the big areas that that's done in is right sizing and decommission. So um, what you're gonna find in the cloud is that there are a lot of tools that let you do cost reporting, and they're gonna show you some recommendations on where you can save. Um, the challenge that we see is that the cost reporting tool and the tool where you actually do the work are separate tools, and that means less work gets done at the end of the day. It's easy to create a report on where you could save. It's harder to actually take action on those recommendations to know if you have permissions to edit um, and decommission something. So what we tend to focus on is uh, both aspects of it. So showing you the cost savings opportunity and helping you eliminate it right there. So if I could just see the cost savings opportunity, if I right size this instance, I'll save $1,000. If I downsize um, this instance, if I decommission something, I'll save all of the, the cost of it. Uh, but being able to click the button right there to do it or once um, confidence is built in the system and you know that it's working for a particular environment, fully automating that right sizing or decommissioning um, on the next maintenance window. So we have lots of customers who start with manual uh, right sizing and manual decommissioning, but over the course of eight weeks, uh, once they get familiar with the system, um, they there are start to automate pockets of that. So they get to a point where 60% of their cost optimization becomes automated. So that, that's a huge opportunity to save big um, off of the cloud bill. The big difference between the kind of legacy on-premise environments where it was a fixed expense upfront um, and we owned the resources, now everything is like electricity. And when it's off, we don't pay the bill. So right-sizing and decommissioning are huge uh, vehicles to save a lot of money. And my best uh, example of that is a CFO for a, a multi-billion dollar software company. Um, he was receiving bills for 70 different cloud accounts across AWS and Azure. And after IT uh, implemented Snow Commander, they were able to do 13,000 uh, right-sizing actions within two to three months. And that saved them a million and a half off of their cloud bill. And I like to cite this one, not because it's our largest cost saving story, uh, but because of the amount of work they were able to do in such a short time. So where else could you do 13,000 uh, right sizing actions? That's huge. Um, and this, I think going forward is kind of the future of cloud is things are gonna happen so fast. Um, development teams are gonna do things programmatically with software. They're gonna be spinning things up, down, left, right. It's hard to keep track of it all. So you need some system that can give you the reporting and then to a certain degree, the automation, if you're gonna keep up um, with that level of automation that's happening on the provisioning side. So uh, people underestimate the power of uh, power scheduling. And if you just think about um, in a week, if someone is working 40 hours a week, there's 166 hours in a week and you can save 65% of uh, a development workload if you just power schedule that or just turn it off when the developer is not at work. Um, so you just set your start time, your end time, 
um, and you turn off the machine in those hours, and that is a massive savings opportunity in any development or, or uh, testing or non-production environment. I'll touch on this really quickly because this is Azure only, um, but there are different savings uh, for development and test environments in Azure, and if you go pay as you go uh, versus their enterprise option, you can save different levels. Uh, but essentially what they're doing is they're giving you Windows and SQL Server uh, build at the rate of a Linux VM, which is a significant discount. Um, and then you're getting a uh, big savings, 50% off on PaaS services like uh, Maps, G uh, GPS, other uh, tools that um, development teams will be pulling from. So lots of savings definitely to be had in a dev test environment. And I mentioned this briefly, um, of course, um, there are pre-production pre and staging environments that are temporarily used. Why not just shut them off uh, when we're not using them to save that extra funds? And, and as I say, all of these things, that, yes, there are nine ways to save uh, in the cloud. Not all of these savings are equal. Some of them require more work. And you'll have to dig into your environment, work with your teams to understand what the easiest thing to do is for you to save the most amount of money. Um, I'm a big fan of the 80-20 rule. And if you just did 20% of this, these activities that saved you 80% of the savings opportunity that you have, that's probably the best thing to do for your business. So don't think you need to do everything. Uh, I just like to share them all in case you are already doing a bunch of them um, and you wanted a couple new tactics to consider. So the last thing, another Azure specific uh, savings opportunity is just around developer credits. Um, so in the cloud, if developers are using uh, Visual Studio, MSDN, et cetera, um, you can save um, at these tiers. So they have a professional, a platform, and an enterprise level. Um, and at the enterprise level, if we had a team of 100 developers, that's 180,000 savings uh, for that team per year. So big savings to be had um, kind of across the board in all of the different clouds. Um, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Colin for the demo. And then after that, I do have a cheat sheet because I know that was a lot of information. And um, what I like to do is just kind of make that a little bit simpler, a little bit more straightforward. So if I can give you a cheat sheet that says, here's the nine ways, the level of commitment, and then the savings, uh, you won't have to reference the entire deck um, every time. So over to you, Colin. Perfect. Thanks, Ali. So what I want to show you guys here in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is just how we can take some of the information that Ali presented and automate that and make it easy to realize those savings. So what I'm going to be showing you today is Snow Commander. Uh, it is a cloud management platform where we can take a look at your cloud accounts as well as your, your on-prem virtualization. But we're going to focus on the cloud accounts for today. So the first thing you need to be able to realize the savings is you need insight. You need intelligence into what you have in your cloud environments, uh, what those costs are. So what we do in, with the software is we start to pull in the different cloud accounts. So we add your cloud accounts uh, into the system. And this is going to be your Amazon, your Azure, uh, Google, Kubernetes uh, containers. So we'll pull the inventory of what you've got out there. So we've got you know, inventory of what's coming in from AWS. And this is all discovered through the APIs, no agents, um, and things. same thing here for Azure, we'll pull in that inventory. So even if people aren't consuming through a CMP and they're going through cloud consoles or they've got uh, CI CD pipelines that are creating objects in the cloud, Commander is gonna go, go ahead and discover those objects. The other aspect is we need to be able to pull billing information. So we can come in here and we can also retrieve billing data. So that's gonna give us the actual costs that are uh, that you're accumulating in those cloud accounts. So we have that data coming to us. We also wanna be able to grab tag information. So tag information is gonna give us the business context uh, for what services are being used for and give us another layer of intelligence so we can automatically synchronize tags. So with that type of information, this allows us to build up different views in the product where we can see information like, what is the data cost of these multiple cloud environments? And we can see day by day here what the spend is. We can see where we were last month for spending, where we are this month, 
where we're projected to be at the end of the month. So I can see I'm over spending what I spent last month. We can get the breakdown now of where the spend is happening in different clouds uh, or on-prem. Uh, because we've got the ability to tie into the organizational structure of your enterprise now, we can see who is spending uh, the money. Uh, right now, you know, engineering's got a large chunk here. IT has a fairly large chunk of the infrastructure as well. So now we can answer those questions on who is spending the money. We can see the types of services that we're spending money on. And most importantly, we can now see where do we actually have the ability to realize some savings. So from here, if we want to take a look at say instance downsizing recommendations, now I can come into this interface and realize that I've got a savings opportunity here of almost 300 pounds. Um, I can get the technical information of why we're making this recommendation. And I also have the ability now to actually go ahead and remediate this. And depending on the IT policies, if you're following you know, a strict ITSM policy where everything must go through change management, uh, we can do that. We can make sure this goes through an approval process, hooking into your ITSM solution to do that, or just doing it within the cloud management platform. We're also tracking things like maintenance windows. So we know when the next maintenance window is. We could apply that change during the maintenance window, apply it immediately, or schedule it for an arbitrary uh, time. The other thing that we realize with this is that not all workloads are created equal. You're going to have production workloads. You're going to have development workloads. Uh, so we can create different right sizing groups and policies for production. You know, we want to be less aggressive. We may want to take a larger window of time to make that recommendation. Where with your development machines, we can be very aggressive with those recommendations and we can take a smaller window. So maybe after even two or three days, we can make an aggressive recommendation off of what we're seeing of the performance characteristics of that workload. So we've got that ability to uh, treat workloads differently. If we go back into the cost dashboard, we can even you know, drill into a certain day if we want. So if we want to take a look at a, a day here, we can see what the cost was for that day, take a look at the cost deltas. So it really allows you to drill into uh, the costing information, see where the money is being spent, see where trends are for increased costs, as well as built out any filtering data if we want to take a look at just a specific cloud, or if we want to take a look at a specific organization, so just engineering, and even getting to the point of filtering down into the tagging information. Uh, so if we want to take a look by project, we can filter down to that level. So Insight is, is huge for just grabbing the information, being able to analyze it, and then see where those costs are happening, and also do some remediations around uh, right-sizing power scheduling. The other thing that we have the ability to do is we can extend this functionality out to the stakeholders within the enterprise. All in all, the stakeholders in your business want to be good corporate citizens. A lot of times they just don't have the visibility of what they're spending. Uh, so with a cloud management platform now, we can extend that visibility through a self-service portal where you can create different RBAC roles to uh, allow them to make changes to certain workloads, uh, but still have you know, restrictive permissions on this so they can't uh, uh, go in and maybe you're not going to give them console access, but you can give them visibility into the recommendations and they can put a change request in for that. But you can create whatever RBAC roles you need to do this. But now uh, I can give the engineering manager visibility into all the workloads that they're consuming across different clouds, as well as their own cost dashboard now. So they can see their slice of the pie, they can see the recommendations that they have, and they can go ahead and they could remediate these recommendations with proper RBAC permissions. The other thing we can do is we can set up things like budgets so they can see where they're spending now uh, and if they're getting close to their budgets. Uh, but we can also present them with a service catalog, and this is where we can start to take some of those best practices and embed them into the process. So. If I wanted, uh, as a developer, an Apache Tomcat server, I can request the service. The CMP also knows, you know, where is the cheapest spot to get this? Is it in AWS? Is it in Azure? Uh, what would it cost to put this into my own on-prem data center? We can provide all that information. We can also start to ask questions that are just going to opt the uh, user into 
certain cost saving policies like what time zone are you in? Well, I'm in GMT. So what this can do is this can set a power schedule group automatically in the background once it's provisioned so that machine is just powered on during business hours. Uh, we can also do things like collecting expiry dates. Not all workloads need to be live forever. If it's a test dev workload that may only need for a month, the user can set that, that they only need that for a month. So if we need that till the end of August, we'll yeah, set I'm that calling. up now we can have automated policies. We, we, we hear this all the time that, um, you know, it's great to have a cost savings report, but if I don't actually own the environment, I can't, it, it's hard to do much with it. It's hard to go and, you know, downsize or power schedule someone else's workload. But by baking it into the request process, you're giving the user the full control and even on the other page where Colin was showing cost savings, people can take action on their own workloads and, and they get their own cost savings recommendation. So this is how you really extend cost savings down to the end stakeholder. So yeah, keep going, Colin, but this is very powerful for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. And, and a lot of it is just showing the user what something is going to cost, uh, just making them aware of it. Uh, there's the old joke always that if you take a developer to a car lot, they're always going to pick the Ferrari even though you know, they might just need the, the Ford Fiesta. Uh, but this is gonna, and a lot of the time is they just don't know the cost. Now we can actually make them aware of what those different costs are as they're making the request. And when it looks good, they can go ahead, they can submit the, the request and get the resources they need. I guess the, the end message is really that you, know, you don't want to limit uh, the ability for users to get the resources they need to do their job. We just want to do it smart. Uh, we want to do it being cost effective uh, and we want users and developers to be agile but you know still keep a rein on costs and keep things in control so with that i'm going to turn it back over to ali to go over some of those cheat sheets and i uh, hope you found that informative so let me flip it back over to ali right now yeah thanks colin and and i hope you can see everyone that it's a big topic. Cloud management is becoming so business critical and even just picking cost as one piece of the cloud puzzle, um, we could talk for this on hours. So of course, if you have more information on anything, you wanna go deeper on any topic, you can talk to your Bytes uh, sales representative and we'd be happy to get on with you um, and walk through your specific use case. Um, so getting into kind of the cheat sheet, I just like to have this one slide that kind of sums everything up. Um, it's a good reference for you to understand uh, what the savings um, program is, what the level of commitment is. Not everybody's ready to commit to three years in one cloud. Um, maybe they've kind of grown to a million dollars of spend um, in one particular cloud, but they're not locked into that cloud just yet. So um, just to understand the level of commitment and then the potential savings uh, kind of across the board. Um, so I think that's a good cheat sheet. You'll have that uh, in the reporting and when we send out the content. I wanted to touch on two other things really quickly. Um, this is a sneak peek of our next webinars coming up. Um, so the Commander platform doesn't just do cost optimization like we mentioned, it's actually um, embedded in your environment. So you can do that portal and service requests like uh, Colin was just showing us. You can automate the approval process and you can do the full deployment um, automation for the resources, the applications, security, everything that you need to do top to bottom. So kind of end-to-end workflows uh, for the entire uh, stack. And something we get asked a lot is, are you trying to replace um, existing tool sets? And typically, no, you already have your best-in-class ITSM, your favorite scripting language. Um, you have all of your application deployment, your network security, et cetera. You have your toolkit. Uh, we integrate with um, virtually everything in your environment. And what we are trying to do is solve that kind of end-to-end -end workflow. So if provisioning is taking too long, if uh, service requests and change requests are taking too long, if cost optimization is taking too long, that's kind of what we're in the business of helping you solve is kind of the end-to-end -end process of it. So that's a sneak peek of the full stack cloud management uh, webinar that's gonna be coming up soon. So with that, I will pass it back to Dan. Super, thanks so much, Ali. Um, just one question that, that, that's appeared so far, I don't know if, if there's any um, questions, if the uh, attendees could pop them in now, that'd be great. 
Um, but um, you know, the first question that's come up is, oh, what's the, the implementation period and, and stand up time and uh, what's the time to value that a business can expect? Yeah, I'll, I can address that generally and then Colin, maybe you can give more specifics. I know that you're involved in a lot of uh, customer environments, but um, the, the stories that I like to tell are the people who um, they're trying out multiple different options. So us and a couple other cloud tools or maybe even the cloud native Azure cost optimization. And they've gotten our system up and running within a couple hours. Um, it's literally just adding your cloud credentials and you're up and running. Uh, and then saving money in weeks. And and but and that global retailer and uh, billion dollar software company I mentioned are both examples of getting to millions of dollars in savings in a couple months. So time to implementation and time to value are very, very fast. Uh, I don't know if you had anything specific to add around install implementation, Colin. Yeah, so one of the things that we kind of we want to do right out of the box is provide that value. Um, so when you add your cloud accounts in, we're actually going to go back historically and grab performance data so that we can make those recommendations right away. Uh, so you know, within those couple hours, you're going to be seeing recommendations showing up for right-sizing workloads. You can also take advantage of the power savings right away and doing power scheduling. Uh, so that very first day, you are going to be able to realize savings out of the box. Yeah, and my recommendation there is there is a um, there's a free trial for the platform. Um, you can get into it. You can set it up on your desktop uh, with a small database. You can hook it up to a cloud account, and for a limited subset of your cloud, you could actually see some of those recommendations and just uh, and make it simple that way. Super, thanks, Ali. Um, uh, another question that's come through is. Uh, can you build up a collection of resources to represent uh, a whole project and submit that for approval? Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, so with the service catalog, we support a lot of different components that can be built into uh, different services. Uh, so depending on the cloud, if we're talking uh, Azure, we can support ARM templates. For AWS, we can support CloudFormation templates. We also have integrations into uh, Marketplace, as well as some of the public images that the, the clouds offer. So you can build these up into complete full application stacks. Uh, and then we can also leverage configuration management tools to do any post-provisioning configuration like Chef, Ansible, uh, Puppet, if we need to uh, integrate with those tools as well. Super, thanks Colin. Um, and I think the, the final question which I can see is that in your experience, what's the largest saving opportunity area that you come across? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I can take that one. I would say the answer for these kind of questions is it always depends. Um, definitely in your development and your test environments, if you're not leveraging power schedules, I would say that that alone, if you could deploy that across the board, that 65% savings off of dev test environments um, is massive. And um, we, we have an ROI calculator that we walk people through just to get a sense for the environment size, what percentage of the environment is production versus non-production, and then we can produce a whole um, ROI report. And I would say that power schedules um, always comes up as number one in those environments, and then right sizing and decommission comes up as number two. Um, of course, right sizing and decommission requires more action. I have to get in there. I have to decide if I'm going to accept the recommendation, which is to go from you know a T3 to a T2. Uh, I have to know the implications of the end user that I'm impacting. Um, so there can be a, that one extra step of validation with right sizing, but with power schedules it's kind of across the board. If you are in a development group, um, I know where you work, I know your time zone, I should be able to set a power schedule. And as Colin showed in the platform, if we incorrectly power schedule someone or they decided to work late one night and their machine got shut off, they can just go into the portal and turn it back on. So uh, the implications of power schedules are low, there's low risk, and I think that 65% savings is a huge opportunity. Um, yeah. Super. I think there's just one more question that's come through, um, uh, and it is, is there a way to compare costs from two different months? 
Yeah, absolutely. On the cost analytics dashboard, um, I was able to show what the cost was last month compared to what the cost is this month. Um, one of the other things that I didn't show was you can actually do cloud to cloud cost comparisons. So you could take workloads that are running in AWS and compare what would that cost to put those workloads into Azure, also taking into account right size and recommendations, or you know, what would my on-prem workloads cost to put those into cloud, uh, do that type of analysis. So it gives you really deep cost analysis, cloud to cloud, um, and also as to your question, month to month as well. And the, the only thing I would add there is there's a robust uh, reporting engine in the platform as well. So whatever you're trying to do, if it's inventory, if it's cost comparison, um, if it's forecasting, all, all of that kind of stuff is in the reporting engine. Um, and like I said, if uh, we want to go deeper on any of these, that's not a problem. Um, the next webinar, we should touch a little bit more on reporting uh, when we talk about end-to-end -end, uh, provisioning and management. Brilliant. Thanks, Ali, and, and thanks, Colin, also. I think um, there's no more questions, so um, unless anything pops up immediately, we'll, we'll draw an end to um, the webinar here. Um, first and foremost, thank you for all the attendees for joining us. I hope you found it useful. Um, and just a brief reminder, if, if you can um, complete that feedback form, it would be um, much appreciated by all of us here at Byte. Um, as I said, it helps the content is um, you know, as good as it can be, for, um, which ultimately benefits you guys. Um, so thanks for joining. Thanks again, Colin, um, um, and thanks, Ali. Um, and hope to see you all on a, a webinar in the near future. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great day. Take care now. Thank you. All right. Bye.